Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our Facebook Live, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And as we wind down the month of September and move into the month of October. So I'm supposed to speak about research in pancreatic cancer, and I will get to that. But I just want to tell you uh, a little bit about an event I went to yesterday. Um, I won't use people's names because I'm not sure I'm allowed to use the names. Um, you know, one of the things when you look at venture capital, which is investing in companies, it ends up that 97% of venture capitalists, the money is controlled by, is run by men, and between 2 and 3% is run by women. And um, some of you remember that we had a speaker here, Jenny Abramson, who actually wrote an article with us in JACR, so you can read that article. And she spoke about this in detail. And she runs the largest venture firm for women called Rethink Impact. And I was invited yesterday to go to their annual meeting. And at their annual meeting, it's just something amazing. They have uh, some of the companies that they're invested in speak about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And they also have other people speak about just the whole idea about uh, gender and investment and profitability. So uh, the fund is um, invests only in companies that have women CEOs, or it could be a man CEO, but have women very high up in the structure of the company and help run the company. And also they only invest in things that have a social purpose. So for example, if you said, we're going to dig and drill for oil, maybe it's a great idea and you can make a lot of money, but it's not a company they're going to invest in. So you have to think about social. So things that they spoke about and this has been written up in part of the places is in banking and education, healthcare, and there and there are other companies actually that do invest in that space where you know you're looking at you know social good, and that becomes a very important thing social impact, where yes you know it'd be good that you can make a lot of money perhaps in making jet engines, or drilling for oil or digging for diamonds perhaps, but that's probably not a very socially conscious. Uh, thing and they're not investing in Northrop or Boeing or companies that would make weapons of mass destruction, which again is very very uh, profitable probably. So I heard several stories yesterday, and again this is not a confidentiality thing, but for example, there's a company that's working with women to invest, and the person in charge uh, made the point that women are much different than men in terms of how they invest. In part, they overthink things, and maybe because of training and how they grew up, they're not as risk, not as risk takers as men typically are. So the number that was said is seven, if, women, if a woman has a dollar, 71 cents will be in cash. If it was male, it would be probably, you know, 20 cents, 10 cents. So women are extremely, extremely conservative. And she also spoke about how in part women want to understand, but they really have not had the ability in getting a book or making a website or a company more woman friendly by having a little bit of pink around or saying you're woman friendly probably isn't something that works out. And so they also said that the way women kind of think about things is also a little bit different. And so they've approached it a little bit differently. So for example, they said a woman looks at goals. Now, if you said a man, they'll say, okay, well, how did the fund do? Okay, well, the stock market went up 10%, the fund went up 12%, it beat the, the numbers. It went, down, went up 8%, it was not good, it didn't match the numbers. But she said women are a little bit different. Women are more goal-oriented. So if you said to a woman is, okay, the question would be, what do you need to get that house you want? Or what do you need to be able to retire? Or what do you need to get that second home? Then they're more willing to invest knowing they're on this road to something that they're going to get. It's not um, just this very uh, nebulous thing where you're collecting more chips than the other person has. And so one of the things they're working on, and, and she said that you can open an account with her company for a dollar. Not going to get very far, but you can open it with a dollar. They'll give you a lot of information. And you can open it with $10 million, somewhere in between. And in fact, under the seats, on a number of chairs, and I got one of them, there was an envelope for their company, and you get $100 startup. If you're a woman, you can 
open an account for hundred dollars, so I gave it to I gave it to Whitney. But you know, it, it was it was really brilliant. And the person in charge had been a high executive at you know the classic Wall Street companies, and now she's doing this change to see um, how she can help people in that regard. There was another company that um, is working on a test for Alzheimer's, and I heard them speak last year, and hopefully the person in charge will be one of our guest speakers this year at Hopkins in my speaker series, and she spoke about how well they're doing in terms of the test, and that they also not only could detect Alzheimer's early with a high degree of accuracy on a test that's a computer-based test, which costs under $100 or something like that, rather than thousands of thousands of dollars. And they also have worked on how you can actually prevent development of Alzheimer's or slow it down uh, just by a number of different tests and features and everything else. So it's exceedingly exciting when you think about the population uh, is aging in the U.S. and worldwide, and Alzheimer's is a problem and will become only a bigger problem. There's another person who spoke about the economy, and uh, they also spoke about, um, you know, the, the three C's, you know, where will uh, uh, growth be, and uh, they also spoke about the fact that future might be a six-hour workday, which is hard to imagine, but also the fact that caregiving, that whole thing, whether it's caregiving for little kids, you know, uh, day school, daycare, or for elderly, is the fastest growing. It's growing 49 percent per year, far more than any other industry, and will continue to grow. And particularly with an older population, the caregivers on the top end. And uh, she was making the point that you want caregivers who really give care, that you want people who are educated. You don't want the lowest common denominators of working in a nursing home or something like that. You want people who really are companions, who really can be helpful in keeping people engaged. So she did speak about how that's going to really change the economy and how things are going to change. Uh, she made the point that uh, the, the area where uh, AI is going to do the most damage in terms of jobs is probably to women. Women have a lot of um, jobs in accounting uh, where they have been very helpful or within companies where they're administrative types where they control a lot of the numbers and information. But she was saying AI Automation will wipe all that out. So women will be more affected than men, perhaps, in this change of jobs, but it will create new opportunities, perhaps for better paying jobs, for more challenging jobs, but it will change. And so uh, as a woman, you probably would need to be paying attention if that's your job you have now, really where you need to recycle and rechange to be able to move up to the next level. So I think that was really good. Um, they did speak about, uh, there was a couple of people who spoke about biases in that, uh, you know, they were showing and they did some testing. One person uh, had their article published in Harvard Business Review a few months ago, making the point that when venture capital people ask men things before they fund them, they ask different things to women, and women tend to answer differently. So the fact is, for the same pitch, Basically, a man might get 10 times as much money as a woman or may get funded and a woman would not. So they were talking about how uh, boards need to get around that bias because they're passing up a lot of good opportunities. A couple of the speakers did make the point that now they're giving back to women, so they are taking their time and being on boards. They did make the point that women are always on nonprofit boards or non-paying jobs. Women need to be on boards that are paying, but also boards that make the decisions on investing. And that um, when women present to venture people, when women are involved, they feel more comfortable and they feel less stressed and they're more apt to perform better. So uh, I think um, a, a number of points were made there that, again, the, uh, this unconscious bias, both in terms of giving money and how you ask questions, what you assume, and how women answer questions, which is maybe not the same as their counterparts do, and their answers actually put them in a more precarious position because they tend to, like they mentioned, the point is you would ask a man, how long is it going to take you to get in a million new customers? And you'd ask a woman, how are you going to manage to keep the customers you have? So you get into a very defensive, well, I'm trying to keep the customers this way and that way. 
But really the answer is you're trying to grow and you will lose some people on the way down. But what's your trajectory and what's your guidance and what do you plan on doing? So I thought that was, that was uh, very good. Um, there was a speaker who um, is actually one of the co-owners of the Washington sports teams, you know, the hockey team, the Capitals, and the, the Wizards, and the, the Verizon Center, and the like, and the women's basketball team. Um, and uh, she spoke about her personal challenges, and actually, uh, I did post that on CTS Us, not her talk yesterday, but she mentioned that uh, she gave a TED Talk a year ago, and it's really a wonderful TED Talk. Uh, it's very personal. Uh, it's about her challenges, the tragedies that have occurred to her, and how she's managed to move forward through those tragedies. Um, it's a very, very uh, compelling story. Uh, it's a very honest story, and it's, uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, having sat there listening to the story, and the story is, is longer on TED, I think it's like 16 or 17 minutes, and there were only like 8 or 10 minutes yesterday, but it's just... Uh, a very, very uh, impressive uh, fighting against all odds would be the, the way you would have to look at it. But just a very, a lot of good lessons uh, learned there. And I did invite her to be a speaker at Hopkins, so we're going to see what happens. Uh, and she tentatively said yes, at least in my mind, she said yes. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, now, pancreatic cancer, so I have only a few minutes left. This is the ARCR, AACR cancer report. And uh, I spoke, it's American Association for Cancer Research, and the meeting three days on pancreas last weekend. There was 600 people, maybe five radiologists. I spoke, someone from Mass General, I mean, someone from Dana Farber, and someone from MD Anderson were on the radiology side. The rest were on genetics, on liquid biopsies. Uh, just tremendous, tremendous progress. And you look at this, uh, this goes through all different cancers, but it does talk about pancreatic cancer. And so I spoke about deep learning, and I spoke about cinematic, and I spoke about radiomics. One of the person from Andy Anderson gave this incredible presentation on how they're looking at CT scans to determine response to chemotherapy. We've mentioned that before. People have done that with colon cancer, with renal cancer, but you can do it with pancreatic cancer and predict response. Very, very good material, and we're going to do that at Hopkins as well. And the person from Dana-Farber spoke about how they try to look at how patients will do with pancreatic cancer by doing a mass measurement, looking at muscle mass versus fat. And people have done that before, trying to figure out if patients will be good transplant candidates, for example, be it kidney or liver, especially liver, if patients would be good risk factors for getting surgery like transplants. So there are a lot of things. Uh, it was interesting, you know, with so much about pancreas, everyone pushed MR, ML, MR for many years. There were three talks on imaging, and every one was on CT. How to predict outcomes based on muscle mass, how to look at the, the pancreas, analyze it, determine what the patient's response will be to chemotherapy. And then it's, of course, us looking at detection, optimizing detection with deep learning. The idea about using information to predict outcomes and stuff is not a surprise, right? Uh, there's a contest. There was just a recent uh, Vita meeting in, in Spain, and Siung Park, who was one of our really great computer people, finished second. Okay, what can you say? Wasn't first, but that was pretty good. She finished second, and the job was to take, uh, to do radiomics, looking at data of CT of patients with pancreatic cancer, looking at some clinical data in labs, and predicting survival. So it's interesting that you can predict who will do well and who will not do well. So the question is, you know, and I've spoken about this before on CTSS, on our lectures and on Facebook, how do you really build in these, this information that uh, I came up with at the end of my talk, I had a couple, I had slides and I said, you know, now till to date, when we talked about CT, we talk about speed of acquisition, slice thickness, number of detectors, arterial face, venous face. And then I looked at the images. We did a lot of 3Ds in Hopkins, so we did better than others. But you still were really looking at a data set view with your glasses and trying to determine things. Now, 
my prediction is over a couple of years, you'll be doing the same CT scan, probably the same parameters, but now you'll be looking at the radiomics. You'll be looking at the AI for detecting the presence of disease, particularly early disease, I believe, where it's beneath our level to see it, where computers can recognize changes and patterns. And we're predicting also, once the patient has a mass, what chemotherapy they should do, when will surgery be the best optimal time, is this a good surgical candidate, what needs to be done. And the other thing is, as liquid biopsies come along for follow-up, detection, as we get into this whole process of really combining all the information we have, I think things are going to be very, very exciting. I think as radiologists, the thing you need to know is that business will not be as usual. How we get paid, all those other things, I don't know how that's going to change. But I think you really do need to be paying attention. You're in private practice now. You're not really involved in doing this, but you can get involved. Well, you can be paying attention. In fact, one of the things I would like, if people want to send me, and I am going to try to put together some type of proposal for this, we would love to get outside scans, the identified of patients with pancreatic cancer from different scanners. We have semen scanners. We would want to run our algorithms on non-semen scanners and different protocols to see and make sure we're doing optimal detection. So I think there's a lot of really good interest in doing things better, and we're trying to be at the front end of making things happen. So I notice my time is up. Anyone have any questions by show of hands? Well, let's see who's here. Oh, hey, Lidiana. So Lidiana is joining us from, uh, from Houston, Texas, and Meg Fines. I thought, Meg, aren't you in Ireland or something? I guess they have internet in Ireland. They have electricity in Ireland. I was there. I have a lot of friends in Ireland, in Dublin. So I only can say great things about Ireland because they have very good smoked salmon and bagels. And they have that bog or peat moss or whatever it is. It's a bog, and they throw it in the, the fireplace, and it smells incredibly good. I think it's something to get from bogs. That's what I call it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the only issue I had when I went to Ireland, to be honest, and a whole bunch of Irish people would give me a hard time, is they, it, I was there the 250th anniversary of Guinness, and everybody got a free glass of Guinness. And I was at a very nice party prior to my talk, and they, made, and they gave me this glass of Guinness. And, you know, it's not like you drink a little bit of Guinness. I mean, it, the glass is like, a, it looks like a, a super drink. I'm surprised Mayor Blumberg hasn't outlawed that. But the Guinness is, I don't like beer. I don't drink beer anyway. But that Guinness, boy, that was terrible. And they told me, okay, there's another type of Guinness that the women tend to like. This is a little bit milder. And that was twice as terrible as the French one. So I drank like 0.1 millimeters, milliliters of Guinness. So uh, I was not a great uh, visitor. Um, but I did not say anything bad. They were nice people. And uh, it was really a great meeting a couple years ago. And the people we know, we know a lot of people there, but especially Leo Lawler, who's in Dublin. He's head of a hospital. And Leo was a, uh, a, a fellow here, in fact, we here for a number of years. And uh, so with that, if no one has any questions, you can ask questions later. I'll sign off and we'll see you next week. Have a great end of September. Bye.